my talk. Here we go. Uh. Ah, he said he living life as a gringo. Where you question, where you fit, and every time you mingle, they say you do this with not enough that. My rapping is really bad. <laughs> this life as a gringo. Yes, hello and welcome to another episode of Life as a Gringo. I am Dramos, of course, and it is Thursday, so it means it's time for our Thursday Trends episode. I'm going to be flying solo on today's show, diving into a few different topics that have caught my attention over the last week. So we're going to talk about a few things, man. So we have this new uh, data that has come out that uh, says Latinos are taking over uh, the state of Texas, which you love to hear. We're also going to talk about the effects of Roe v. Wade being overturned, the, the ban on abortion, and how that has particularly affected Latin women uh, in, in, a, in a crazy, crazy way. So we'll talk a bit about that. We will also touch on a taqueria in Sacramento that was really just taking advantage of their employees. Of course, their their employees were were migrants, uh, many of which, and were just not being treated like human, which is you know a a sad reality and a sad common occurrence, I guess you could say, in today's culture here in this country. So we'll touch on that, and then for our mihente segment, on a positive note, we will talk about multiple. Latinos receiving a Hollywood Walk of Fame star this upcoming year. Very, very cool stuff. So I'm excited to to share all of that. But first and foremost, as we always do, let's start with some of the, the nonsense, the BS in a segment we call for the people in the back. Say it louder for the people in the back. All right, so this story I wouldn't particularly call like nonsense or a heavy story. This actually could be in the mihet this segment, but we'll we'll keep it here for now. And that is the idea that the new face of Texas, the new face of the state of Texas, is Latino, right? Now, according to WeArmyTo.com, who who did this great article, they're saying that Latinos now outnumber non-Hispanic whites. So according to recent data. Latinos comprise around 40.2% of the state's population, just a nose ahead of non-Hispanic whites, who are 39.8%. Most of the 12 million Latinos that call Texas home actually live in just five counties, Harris, Bexar, Dallas, Hidalgo, and El Paso. Now, I, I bring this up, we're just talking about one state in particular, and maybe this doesn't affect you if you don't live in the state of Texas, but I bring this up as a means to continue to remind us of our power, right? Because we're still somewhat operating from the scarcity mindset as if we don't have the numbers, as if we don't have the um, you know, economic power to, to affect real change. We're still operating from this place of, of lack. And of course, it's not all our fault. We live in a country that tries to make us feel lesser than, or at least a a great number of people in this country attempt to do so and attempt to make us feel like we don't belong here. But the reality is when I see shit like this, you know, what's going on in Texas and that uh, Latinos are the the majority now in, in Texas, it just shows you the amount of power that we have, right? The way that we spend our money, uh, you know, the things that we do or don't participate in, you know, we have a lot of power that we are just not utilizing, right? be it lack of fear. And listen, I understand, you know, for some people who aren't citizens, it's scary to navigate this, right? Because you are constantly living in fear and your family is constantly living in fear and you don't want to rock the boat and possibly bring attention to yourself unnecessarily while you are trying to figure out, you know, what what you're doing here with your, your status. But I think in general, generally speaking, it's just a reminder of of the amount of power we potentially could have if we all came together if we were a little bit more, you know, man, uh, if we were a little bit more, I don't want to say discipline, but a little bit more intentional, even with something like our spending, what are the, the companies, the brands, the people that we are supporting, right? 
the campaigns that we are potentially donating to as far as politicians go, right? Just being far more intentional with our our spending because we are a powerful economic group in this country if we choose to to take that power. And then also with when it comes to influence, right? What are the things that we are supporting? You know, are we coming out in large numbers collectively to support, uh, you know, Latin led TV shows or films or content or whatever it might be? Right. Like I I, I just watched this is like a, a side. I guess it's related to this. But I made a promise on the podcast that I was going to watch the Flaming Hot movie uh, on, on Hulu, which is all about the creator of Flaming Hot Cheetos. Um, and it was directed by Eva Longoria. That shit was amazing. Let me let me tell you. I'm gonna I'm gonna break off from Thursday trends for a second. We're just gonna get into like a personal tidbit here. I personally, and you you may have heard me talk about it or allude to it in different conversations we've been having over the last couple of months, but I personally have been battling a ceiling that I placed on myself with limitations and and sort of limiting what my the size of my goals could be, right? I came to this realization that I was holding back, that I was limiting my goals to make them feel a little bit more realistic and as a result not letting myself live up to my full potential right and i've been battling where physically or i guess in like the real world sense i am going after these goals i'm you know breaking them down into smaller steps i'm i'm doing the little things i have to do but mentally there was a part of me that still didn't believe that this particular goal that i'm i'm going after didn't believe that it was possible, right? There was a part of me that thought this is just an impossible idea for you to do. And, and you know, I share pretty much everything with you guys. I'm My big goal, one of my biggest goals in life as far as career-wise and media goes, I've always dreamed of hosting a late night show, right? And now at this point in my life, recognizing what makes me happy, A, that would make me happy, but B, in the way that I do it is having ownership over it and independently creating it and then partnering with a bigger brand, you know, to to bring it to life, right? Or to um, make it that much bigger because I'm not waiting for anybody to bring it to life. So I've literally was shaking with this idea and just so excited about it, you know, shaking with excitement. I was sitting in the car or driving in the car and ideas were just flowing. But I, I didn't believe that I actually could pull this off in the way that I want to, right? Because I'm not talking about just doing it on, a YouTube channel or something like that. I want this to be a legitimate, you know, show that that people can watch anywhere and everywhere, right? And there's this limiting belief that had been coming up in my mind that this is just too big or this is crazy or what makes you think you could do it. All of the the things that come up, right? When we set out on a path of of chasing after goals. And it was this internal struggle that was happening. Again, I was taking the steps, I was sending emails to people, I was scheduling meetings. I was prepping behind the scenes, you know, as I still am. Um, but mentally, there was a part of me that was living in doubt. And that's inevitably going to get in my way of making this a reality. Because if I don't believe it myself, how can I convince other people to buy into it, right? So that's a, a, a long way around saying, I've been doing that work to get through it. I've been talking to my therapist about it and, and really just trying to be proactive and when I interview people who I, I think have a great perspective on this, you know, inserting myself in there a little bit selfishly uh, and, and getting their point of view. But I watched this movie, Flame and Hot, and seeing this person's story, seeing them come from never even graduating high school to being involved in gangs to being broke, then developing this, pretty much saving a, a company and then becoming an executive completely changing his family's life in the process is just a reminder like, man, anything is possible. You just have to have the guts to go out there and do it. You just have to have the, the you know, the, man, the, the lack of fear or not the lack of fear because we all still feel that fear, but we have to push past it, right? You have to have the strength to push past that fear and actually go after what you want and take action. And I cried during this movie. I I literally just felt like this relief in watching it where it was like this was the last thing I needed to break that ceiling that I'd put over myself. And like I literally was just like when I walked out of my living room watch from watching that movie, it was just like, yeah, everything I want, I'm about to go out and get, you know, in my mind, I'm telling myself, like, you're going to change the world, you know, and I confidently believed that. Like, I genuinely believed it. I believe it right now. And 
A, that's why this this idea of representation always fucking matters. Like Hollywood is Hollywood, and yeah, these are stories and these are entertainment, but they do have an effect on us when we feel like we could see ourselves in it. And I guess the point I'm getting to here is we have these crazy numbers, right? in this country and we are are quickly becoming a larger and larger demographic overall and obviously in, in texas as the majority we have to come out and support one another right because like that movie flaming hot i feel like it put the battery in my backpack it lit the fire underneath me to now go out and create the change that i want to see right and that only happens when there's a belief in our stories right where we're coming out in numbers or they're trying to get our demographic and they're giving us an opportunity to be seen and be heard, right? And and I think I'm, I'm getting to the point that I, I wanted to make with this. But in general, I just want us to recognize our power and recognize that being collective and being deliberate and I guess collectively coming together to support one another, like that's what's going to enact the lasting change I think all of us want to see. And also just create a better better world for the generations to follow, you know. And I think this obviously pertains to any marginalized group. You know, the idea of just supporting people whose voices have often been suppressed and recognizing that there is strength in numbers. And the only way our stories get told and then the inspiration for another idea and story and movement happens is if we are collectively building each other up and and that's the only way that all of this change that we hope to see actually happens you know it's a collective effort and i love seeing stories like this one. i just think it's it's incredible now moving on to something far more depressing um we're going to talk about how latinas bear the brunt of roe v wade's overturn and we're about a year on from the the anniversary of of the overturning of roe v wade and we're, we're seeing the impact that it's had um, you know, the impact of blocking abortion access for, for Latina. So I'm going to read a bit of, of this article from We Are Me Too. It's uh, it was very good, like very well done, I have to say. Um, I always like to to touch, uh, you know, on the st- stuff that they're talking about on that website because they just always have their, their you know, finger on the pulse. So and they say uh, with the passing of Dobbs v. Jackson, federal protection for reproductive rights for women and gestating people ended. Since then, state legislatures have become the adjudicators of women's fundamental human rights, right? So at present, 14 states have near total abortion bans during any point in pregnancy already in place. The states are Alabama, Arkansas, Idaho, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. States such as Arizona, Wyoming, Indiana, and Utah, among others, have similar bans, but the courts have blocked these temporarily. And who are the largest group of women of color presently living in the United States that have instituted abortion bans and egregious restrictions? Latinas. Up to 6.5 million Latinas live in the 26 states that have banned or are attempting to ban or profoundly limit access to abortions, according to the National Partnership for Women and Families and the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice. We're talking of at least 42% of Latinas between the ages of 15 and 49, or four out of every 10 Latinas who call one of these states home. Almost 3 million Latinas who live in these states are economically insecure and deeply impacted by the state's bans. They don't have money to travel to another state for abortion care, which obviously is part of the topic of conversation because rich white people are always going to be able to find a way to do this. And it's us, the everyday people, that are always affected by crazy actions like this one. Now, they're going to say uh, also women can't get an abortion. Many mothers already and many single parents are denied abortion care and are more likely to find themselves mirrored with poverty with little way out. Now, I want to talk about this a little bit. And and A, it's obviously said that that Latinas are, are kind of bearing the brunt of this just because they find themselves in these states where there are pretty much total abortion bans, right? And I also want to go from the other angle because I know there's going to be those who are pro-life supporters who will say, well, just be smart. Just wear a condom. Don't let your partner, you know, ejaculate in, inside of you. Make better decisions. All of the above, right? 
I think, uh, of course, if we're removing any sort of emotion or empathy, there is truth in all of those statements. But also we're human beings, right? And we make mistakes. We make bad decisions. We don't think things through sometimes. And that goes for all of us. And that goes for all of us beyond just sex. There are plenty of times in our everyday lives that we have made decisions that potentially could have had an impact now, on the rest of our lives. Actually grow up and, and become. But mature. luckily, it didn't. It didn't become that, right? God forbid you had a couple of drinks and drove home and then, and then said to yourself, "Man, I'm never doing that again. I don't know how I, I got home. I'm lucky nothing happened." Right? I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have been there, or whatever whatever decision you made. It doesn't have to be that that grand of like life or death. But the idea is this. We all are bound to make mistakes as imperfect human beings. And the idea of not having a choice of how we're going to deal with said mistakes, particularly when it pertains to our body and literally has just an effect on our life and nobody else's, the idea that somebody would try to take control over that, I think, is, is wild. And the implications as they talk about poverty, right? Sure, a mistake was made. But should that person have to suffer for the entirety of their lives because they were young and didn't think a particular situation through? Because when you talk about our communities, marginalized communities, you know, people of color, women of color, many of us generationally are trying to get out of the 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 hole, right? We're trying to build a better life for ourselves and our families had. Many uh, uh, members of our community um, have grown up struggling financially, and we continue in a in a in a in a similar cycle. If we don't educate ourselves and try and do better, right? And by by having stipulations like this one, of you know pretty much full on abortion bans, and if a woman who already is in poverty makes this mistake, now has no choice but to bring a child to life that they can't really afford or you know can't provide for and it's only going to set them back and continue the same cycle of poverty it's an unfair situation to to put somebody in and unnecessary at the end of the day you know and i'm not somebody who is personally for like you know abortions up to the third trimester or things like that no i don't i, don't, I think you, you should have figured out by that point but Within reason, you know, given time for somebody to actually realize they're pregnant and 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 all of the above, they should be able to make that decision. Because it has far more implications than just, oh, now they, you know, I feel like the, the thing that gets written off is like, oh, now you have to actually grow up and, and become mature. And it's like, yeah, sure. But beyond that, many of us are just trying to create a stable life for ourselves because we didn't have that growing up. We're trying to not you know, struggle and live in squalor like our parents did and to not have the ability to make a choice that would affect essentially the rest of our lives, I think, is just wild. And and again, that's why it's so important for women of color and this conversation to be happening, because this is, is whom it's going to affect the most. Again, rich white people will fly to another state, shit, they'll fly to another country, whatever they have to do to get this done. But people who are already who are already struggling financially don't have that same option. And that's why this is going to have a disproportionate effect on, on the lives of, of people in our community as opposed to, you know, others. You know, we're already years behind um, because of the system that that exists in this country. And we're 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 trying to break free of it, right? We're we're seeing improvements in this next generation. And and um, you know, we are are trying to get our, our piece of the pie, if you will. But again, if if now because of one mistake somebody has to suffer for the for the rest of their lives or or put themselves at even more of a disadvantage for the rest of their lives, um, it's it's going to be tough to kind of really be able to dig ourselves out of that and and create I think the the growth and the man the I guess the breakage of generational curses that we're we're all kind of striving for. So just some some food for thought. I'll put the link to that article in. Um, in the show notes, because it's, it's actually a really long article, um, goes into far more information than, than I touched on here. I just kind of wanted to talk about how it's affecting women from our community um, in particular and and 
just the situation that is at, at hand when it comes to that. Now, I want to touch on one last story here for our uh, for the people in the back segment here. I want to talk about this Sacramento uh, taqueria, right? Now, this taqueria threatened employees and actually even hired, allegedly, a priest to find out what they called workplace sins. So a federal court has ordered a Sacramento restaurant, Taquilla Garibaldi, to pay $140,000 in back wages and damages. An investigation found it underpaid employees, threatened them with immigration consequences, and denied breaks. Also, the restaurant allegedly hired a fake priest to, quote, get the sins out of workers as per an employee testimony. And going further in that article, they talk about how they hired this fake priest to kind of like have people confess to stealing and, and things like that. Uh, a lot to cover here. A lot of just nonsense to cover here. I think the hiring a fake fucking priest. See, th- this is like, it's it's so silly and laughable, but at the same time, it's like the cruelty of humanity. And again, further proof of how immigrants and migrants are are not viewed as full human beings, right? The fact that they had wages that were not given to them as they're supposed to. They were threatened with immigration consequences, right? So you have this employer who rather than just being like a decent place to work at and, and just like understanding the mutual transaction that's happening here where you're getting somebody who is working for you and making you money, right? And they are making money and providing for their family. Everybody should be winning here. It should be very simple. But whatever it is, greed, racism, whatever whatever one of those things that, that ends up coming into play in this particular situation, these owners of this restaurant saw these people as lesser than and less than human and that they could abuse them and, and take advantage of them and and the the fears that they have of you know potential deportation or um, you know just just taking advantage of people in their their lowest moment, which is just despicable at the end of the day, right? And and then on top of that, to go a step further beyond just like the greed part of it, the money part of it, but then to play into the fact that you know that these are religious people. And people who are new here, so they're potentially more gullible. And you're going to go and allegedly hire a fake priest so you can get some sort of information out of them and play into even further, you know, this sort of, um, I don't know, this position of like dominance. And again, it's like making, it's like you're making a game out of someone's life. It's really, really fucking sad. I'm not, obviously, I'm not blanket you know, blanketing like every white person in America is racist and believes this and blah, blah, blah. But it is scary and alarming how regularly we hear stories similar to this one that showcase the lack of humanity and in general how a lot of people view immigrants, particularly brown ones, as lesser than human yeah it's it's just it's really disheartening and and that will never that's something i can never get over right because because i I don't see how you can't just look at somebody that you know is struggling that you know is is going through all kinds of shit and just have a a shred of empathy for them that will always boggle my mind I per I like I I can't help but look at people who are hurting and just not want to be another person who adds pain into their life. And I can't fathom that we have a culture where there are so many people who find it so easy to not have any sort of empathy for another human being. That will forever be wild to me. And the fake priest, again, that should, that's just wild. Like That goes beyond just like financial greed. That is just like, man, you really are gamifying somebody's life. That's just crazy. All right, moving on. We're going we're gonna to get some positive stuff here for our me at this segment. Because fuck, man, some, some fucked up people in this world. Shit. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of cleanse our palate now, though, with something positive, though. So. 
We'll, uh, we'll talk about some people from our community who are being honored in our Mi Gente segment. All right, so I'm very excited about this right now. Personally, one of these people, I I wouldn't, I'm not gonna go and claim I'm, I've like worked alongside her, but she, we have worked at the same radio station. I've grown up listening to her, and it's incredible to see her get her flowers right now, and all of these people. So you have multiple uh, recipients of a new Hollywood star, and this is for 2024, and the beauty is there are some Latinos being part of this, right? So the Hollywood Walk of Fame Committee has revealed the 31 new recipients receiving a Hollywood star in 2024. Among those honorees are four influential Latinos, including the legend Mario Lopez, legendary radio personality Angie Martinez, Lilia Stefan, and Raul de Molina. Now, this is just a beautiful, you got to just give people their flowers right here. And, and again, yeah, it's like a star on, on Hollywood, blah, blah, blah. But, but the way I look at it, again, representation matters. I see somebody like Angie Martinez, whom I grew up listening to in New York City radio, whom was a coworker of mine when I was working at Power 105.1 in New York uh, with the Breakfast Club. Someone I would see on a fairly regular basis. I see that that they get honored like this for their work. And again, it makes me feel like I can do anything, right? And there's something just so fucking beautiful about that. There is something, I don't know. Again, because you think about all the celebrities who have stars on, on the Walk of Fame or, uh, in, in Hollywood, and it's some of the greatest actors or entertainers to ever grace this earth, some of the most exceptional people as far as what they did. They are the most exceptional at what they do. And they get to enshrined forever, essentially, right? And and recognized for their greatness, for the hard work and the dedication and their talents that they put into it. So it's beautiful then to see people from our community being held in those same conversations. And it was the same thing with Gloria Stefan being inducted to the, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, you know, Again, this isn't like it's the Latin Hollywood Walk of Fame. This is the, the regular one, and we're now being a part of the conversation. Again, it opens the door for us to be taken seriously just like anybody else, that we don't have to play a particular role or we only exist in the Latin world, which there's nothing wrong with. But the idea of us getting the opportunities and, and, and being able to have our stories heard and, and being able to express ourselves freely in this world and have it be accepted we also have to be playing in the the same ballpark as everybody else, right? And that's what's happening here. And it's just, I don't know, it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I think, yeah, the awards and all these different things, like they're not the priority and they should never be the priority for anybody in any creative field, right? You, you first and foremost should be doing these things because you enjoy doing it because it does something for you, right? Like for me, podcasting, you know, even if uh, there are days where I don't necessarily, I'm not like overly excited to, to jump into the studio and go record an episode. I know that once we hit record, once I get into my flow, I feel good. I love it. Once we're done, I feel a bit more energized, right? Because it's something that I love doing. And I may never win an award for it, but regardless, this is my passion. This is my art, right? So it has to start there in that same manner. But I think all of us want to be recognized for for the things that we're passionate about, the the work that we're putting in. You know, all of us want to hear our boss say good job, or our family members recognize the hard work that we're putting into, um, you know, our everyday life. Even if it's just you know keeping the family together or whatever it is. Like we all want to be acknowledged, right? And I think that that's okay. That's human nature. Again, as long as that's not your only you know, source of motivation, if that's as long as that's not the only thing that's bringing you that feeling of validation. But when you bust your ass and you put your all into something and you hone your craft, of course, you want to you want to, you know, be recognized for that. And you, you want to know that, you know, other people are appreciating all the, the time and effort that you've put into, you know, becoming great at what you do. So that's why stuff like this is beautiful. I can only imagine how they feel, you know, getting getting this sort of opportunity and, and again, representing our community in the process. 
And I just think it's a, a beautiful thing. We got to celebrate these these little moments, these wins that that come along the way. Because again, I, I know I'm feeling inspired seeing somebody like Angie Martinez on there or Mario Lopez, who's just become this crazy kind of media mogul. You know, I know it inspires me to think of how far I can go and, and push my craft and, and, and you know, how much uh, attention to, to greatness I should put into it, knowing where the, the ceiling really is, you know, that it's very high. Um, and I think that moments like this need to be recognized for, for that, right? It's an inspiration, I think, for all of us. And salute to them. Salute to uh, Lola Stefan, Mario Lopez, Angie Martinez, and Raul de Molina for receiving their Hollywood Walk of Fame stars. And um, that's in 2024 that that will happen. So beautiful, beautiful stuff. Salute to them. And man, with that said, let's kind of tie everything we talked about today in a neat little bow in a segment we call Conclusion Stew. Time for Conclusion Stew. All right, so to summarize what we have been talking about today, we have uh, the new face of Texas is brown, people. <laughs> Latinos are... Now uh, around 40.2% of the state's population, just ahead of non-Hispanic whites that are 39.8%. And again, in the bigger picture of all of the, the conversation, it means that we are growing in population, in power, in economic power. And we need to start acting accordingly. Like We need to maintain that power. We need to be very uh, intentional with our dollar, with our time, you know, and support those who look like us and come from similar backgrounds to us, right? And and be proactive about that because that's the only way that we become a part of the everyday conversation. And again, this is the same thing for any marginalized community, any color, community of color in this country. We all have to support one another and also support our own, you know? And, and like I said, it could be something small like supporting the Flaming Hot movie, you know? And knowing that when they get those streaming numbers back, if they're high, it breaks down the door for like four more potential you know latin stories to be told right like that's how this stuff works because they'll look at it and say you know when they go into these meetings that people are pitching stories they'll say oh this is similar sounds similar to the flame and hot movie which you know uh did terrible numbers so we don't think this is going to be a success now luckily this movie had flame and hot has if i'm not mistaken broken some streaming records i think i was talking about it last week so it's done really well that and that continues to you know to have to be the thing that we do we have to keep coming out and supporting you know, to, to make sure that more of our stories are being told and we normalize, you know, a diverse story um, of, of and a diverse representation of what Latinos are in this country. That's why stuff like this is important. And again, now that we're having the numbers, we're seeing it out there. I hope that it encourages people to be, um, you know, feel a little bit, walk a little bit taller, God damn it. And, uh, and, and again, understand that we're doing some great work and we got to come together and just support one another and, and really utilize our power and this you know momentum that we're having right now um even latin music as well by the way i'm gonna throw that in there they were talking about i don't have the numbers in front of me they were talking about how for this is like the first time in however many years there hasn't been a number one um hip-hop album i believe it is or hip-hop uh the probably album um on on billboard and they're talking about the rise of like latin artists and all these different things and like Again, like our time is now. We got to take advantage of it and keep supporting one another because it only creates this avalanche and breaks down so many doors for the next generation to come in. And again, normalizes the idea of having brown uh, faces on the screen and and again, you know, people of color in general on the screen. So just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Uh, now we're talking about one year later after the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the the abortion ban, um, how Latinas are are being disproportionately affected by this. Um, just because of the, they make up the population of many of the states that are are having these really strict and hardcore bans. And on top of that, economically, you know, those who are already struggling now are being set back even further because they're having to, you know, bear the brunt of of a potential mistake that they made. Right. And again, we're all human. We all make mistakes. And I would hate for one mistake that I made to have a negative impact on the rest of my life you know especially if i'm trying to do better and i'm trying to break generational curses you know it, it becomes it's just difficult man you know I, I think we're forgetting the, the human aspect of all of this um when we have, have these conversations around abortion and then there's sacramento taqueria who again just like keeps showcasing the evil that lies inside of some people and how they really dehumanize brown people 
you know, and, and people of color in general, but in this topic, you know, of conversation, immigrants, brown immigrants are not viewed as full human beings. Therefore, you feel comfortable taking advantage of them and not paying them their just due, which you're probably already underpaying them, I would assume. And then on top of that, you're going to steal money from them. And then you're going to threaten them with their worst fear coming to life that you're going to report them, you know, for uh, being illegal or have some sort of immigration consequences, right? That's how you're going to keep them in line. And then on top of that, to make it even worse, be even more of a scumbag, you're going to allegedly hire a priest to feed into, you know, their their religious beliefs to try and get information out of them. Um, it, it's just just really ridiculous. And again, it's just like the lack of humanity will never cease to be uh, appalling to me. And you know, we got to keep just kind of, I guess, talking about these stories and, and, and calling them out when we see them. And, and hopefully little by little, the narrative begins to change. You know, And again, I'm not saying everybody in this country is like that or every white person is evil. Um, but there are enough that it obviously showcases that this is some sort of an, an issue and it's, it's horrible. And then lastly, on a positive side of things, you love to see people's greatness being recognized on the big stage. And you love to see our community being recognized on the big stage. And that's what's happening here as uh, Livia Stefan, Mario Lopez, Angie Martinez, and Raul de Molina um, all being honored and getting their Hollywood Walk of Fame star in 2024 um, is just, again, a testament to greatness, celebrating greatness, and, and celebrating greatness from our community and hopefully inspiring a whole other generation to, to, to keep pushing you know, for, their, for their dreams and knowing that this level of success is possible for them, uh, even if they are in the, the minority. So I think it's just so beautiful on so many levels. I'm, I'm, I'm inspired by it. Genuinely, I'm inspired by it. Uh, and that's it. Uh, just be social club. I keep pushing this. I think we're gonna do like a whole episode. I just want to like really reiterate, but we're getting into the final stretch. I think in, you have three more weeks to sign up. We have a few more slots that we're, we're leaving open. It starts in July. This is a mastermind group. We literally come together as building a community where we can bounce ideas off each other, push each other to grow. It's a 12 month program where literally we have a, a goal for each and every month. And, and the whole ultimate goal is to figure out how to fill your heart at the end of the day, figure out how to make your life that much better. And we have, you know, guests that come on to inspire you and you can ask them questions in the process. Um, we'll do one on ones with myself and my business partner, Brent, uh, Brent J, who uh, is also a certified life coach. So, so many different things. Uh, we're just trying to build the community. Like I've talked about this so much, but like I've done a lot of wellness things, a lot of spiritual stuff, a lot of. I've gone on a retreat before, you know, an intense retreat, and I didn't see anybody that looked like me. So I want to change that, want to bring this to our community because it's been so invaluable to me. And it's my life is incredible as a result of all the work that I've done. And and I want to bring that to our community. And I want to bring a level of comfort that I didn't feel where you have people who look like you and come from similar backgrounds speaking to you. So email Brenda at mindofayounglord.com if you want to be a part of that. Or at DJ Dramos on Instagram, send me a DM. I've been checking them, and I'll uh, I'll forward you the information for that. And uh, man, that's it. Have an amazing Fourth of July weekend. I'm going to be taking off, so no new episode on Tuesday, but we'll be back with Thursday trends next week. So uh, enjoy the long weekend if you get one. I don't know how this works if you get Monday and Tuesday off. Whatever it might be, I'm taking a long ass weekend, so I'm gonna enjoy it and get some rest. Uh, and I appreciate y'all. And you know what? Last thing, just be die NYC. We're going to do a July 4th sale for this weekend. Um, so the code will be just be four, right? So J U S T B E four. Uh, that'll be our, for our 4th of July uh, sale. You get a discount on anything on the website. All right. So that's it. Have an amazing weekend. I'll talk to you all soon. So then stay safe. Peace.